and cut. <laughs> Welcome back to The Purple Worm, and in this episode we're going to be talking about what gives an RPG a uniquely British feeling. <laughs> So, does anyone want to kick us off with what you consider to be the iconic feeling of a British role-playing game? Um, so, I'm going to say, uh, and we've talked about this a bit before, I'm going to say there's a certain kind of humour, and I think you can trace it through Warhammer, links yeah. to 2000 AD, early fighting fantasy. There's some figures that seem to bounce around across them. Some of the writers for, for some of the Warhammer stuff, Mark Gascoigne, we mentioned before. Mm. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know much how to describe it better than that. As I say, I would link it to the kind of British humor you find in 2000 AD, some of our comics. Um, and I think that's been, certainly in the old school, that has been you know, distinctive to certain British games. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a there is like a tendency, certainly with the older, the older British RPGs, to to be a little bit tongue in cheek, to not take themselves mm -hmm. entirely seriously. Now, we're used to a lot of role playing games. More recently, over the last few years, I've tended more towards the sort of like the darker, sort of like grittier sort of side of things. But even sort of like back in the day. Even the the sort of ostensibly more gritty uh, sort of British games like you know like um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which as a setting is fairly unpleasant, you know, if you were living there. However, it still does have a bit of a sort of a thread of that sort of like almost like poking fun at itself a little bit, you know, not taking itself too seriously that runs throughout the game. That's probably the the best example of that I can think of. But I mean, if you think of like, I mean, we've seen this a bit in the um, the Midlands game we're playing at the minute, Colin. You know, where if you look at something like um, the Midlands, which is a fairly recent old school sort of campaign, there's a lot of the sort of British stereotypes represented in that. So particularly in Great London, you've got that sort of like artful dodger like cockney wide boy sort of dick van dyke sort of style the, like, the common green character you mean yeah yeah that's what that's i mean, the <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the, that sort of part of the setting was almost like tailor-made for like colin to be honest that's it that's and why it, i joined <laughs> that's it and i mean i, I know it myself because i i find it almost impossible to like play any sort of like not upper class person in like the midlands without giving them some sort of like horrible cockney accent i do think that has a sort of a valuable use within the game because obviously we all know that the, these are just stereotypes and they're not sort of accurate but they're stereotypes we all know so if i if i'm like oh you see like a guy in a sheepskin jacket looking a bit furtive like walking towards you and he's like oh yeah you so you instantly like know what sort of character that's gonna be yeah so, colin's character <laughs> yeah colin's character <laughs> so it, it is useful, I suppose, as like a, a shortcut to sort of getting you into the game. But I do wonder, because obviously we're talking about sort of British stereotypes. Obviously, we all know these stereotypes because we're British. I do wonder how well some of that translates if you're not British. For, for me, I've always found that the uh, the British RPGs always tend to be sort of tend towards the, sort of the the mundane, the mundane every everyday life. Everything's a little bit shy, okay. um, that sort of thing. Um, that you know, it's it's a grubby, it's usually a, a grubby and and poor sort of setting. Um, and I think often, especially from the seventies and eighties, it reflected society at the time where people didn't have much money. There was still the kick on after the war when sort of uh, industrially we weren't a powerhouse anymore. And I think a lot of the time that's what sort of people wrote about it was the unemployment, these sort of. The social class, the underclasses being trodden on from above. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that the the British games, and I assume games outside Britain, obviously I don't know because I don't have the reference point, but I do think they tend to pull on sort of, uh, if not the actual events, but you know, the sort of like the feelings and the moods of certain mm. events that occurred in the British past. So if you if you look at um, a lot of the, Victor the Victorian sort of era games that. Uh, a lot of games sort of harken back to that era because obviously that was the era when like the the British Empire was at its height. You know, it's a 
it's got that sort of dichotomy of they hadn't yet got rid of like the spiritualism and some of the ancient beliefs but also industry was starting to come in the divide between the rich and the poor really started to become a massive divide at that point people were moving from a rural environment to an urban environment and there was a lot of different changes going on so i think all of those they're all potentially things you can pull plot from and you can get anything that sets up a conflict in a game it is going to generate some sort of story the whole idea of sort of having two sort of diametrically opposed sort of, i suppose forces if you want to call them that is a very british thing because we do have a very divided society so the well, moment... I, right so a sense of class yeah, absolutely definitely. yeah let's just name it yeah absolutely yeah yeah and when it comes class hierarchy to, when, it, when it comes to uh, conflict uh, we, we've got no no shortage of conflict in history either is there no exactly um obviously the with the sort of like the empire and the people sort of heading abroad searching for new lands uh, the various colonies etc i think a lot of these obviously putting aside like the real world sort of virtues and vices of that it allows you to pull a lot of stuff into your game because let's face it if you're running like a if you're running a victorian style game and you go oh, i want to place i want to play an american person you can bring that in you want to play someone from like the raj or something like that you can bring that in it, it's like a, a huge sort of area for you to draw on effectively i think it's noticeable that that there's a little bit of probably embarrassment about the former empire as it were you don't you don't really see too many rpgs straying into that territory in the same way as you 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 kind of kind of find yourself running into trouble if you start banging out RPGs about crusades and stuff. Um, that gets steered away from, and for obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean... Yes, or or if you've got a game that deals with the Confederate States, I mean, that happens with um, Deadlands, you know, that they, they changed their mind about how how central they wanted to make that part of the setting, didn't they? I mean, mm. I mean yeah. that's it. I mean, I, as you guys know, I mean, I've, I've been potentially working on... So sort of doing like a sort of colonial black powder, sort of old school essentials like campaign. And even though I'm not even thinking about publishing that or anything, it's just for a campaign world that I want to run in. Even with that, I've been sort of second guessing myself and starting to think like, oh, how appropriate. So it's to the point where I've sort of decided, all right, I'm going to make it an obvious fantasy world that just takes inspiration from that. Because obviously like most people when they when they set out to publish a game or they set out to play a game, we're not doing it to offend anyone or sort of make any sort of great social point. We're just running a game that we hope people will play in and we hope that we'll have fun running it and people will have fun playing it. But I do think you're right, uh, Con and Dave, you sort of have to be a, a little bit sensitive about these things. Our last call-in episode, we had a, a, a call-in from... It's Conrad, wasn't it? Conrad, Conrad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, he asked whether we thought, what we thought about uh, uh, an American doing doing English. <laughs> um, and I thought that was kind of quite refreshing that someone would even consider that because if you take Dungeons and Dragons, mm. uh, their, their, their idea of what faux medieval European uh, history looks like is strangely like the wild west <laughs> yeah you know yeah, yeah you, <laughs> you know you, the, you, the frontier towns that well, you see appearing in early you, you, you see it, you see it a lot of media don't you i mean look at uh, an american uh, fantasy warrior they think of conan don't they somebody buff somebody strong somebody heroic when when we think of somebody from fantasy you know we've got elric you know somebody who's a little bit weedy still a good fighter but he's the underdog and I think sort of it's come from two different directions, isn't it? Um, right, that, and that's a good that's a good mention you make there because you, you've got the British contribution to Appendix N. Would it be fair to say that that perhaps with Warhammer, Warhammer's in, innovation is that kind of un, unremittingly grim setting? Mm. That actually the American idea of the fantasy is quite is actually quite romantic. 
Yes, mm. it is. Um, mm -hmm. In the early stages, at least. Mm -hmm. and, in the, and perhaps what Warhammer con contributes, and maybe they don't have to be the absolute originator, but there's a willingness to have that idea of a setting where, you know, it's just not going to go very well. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're, you're, you're enjoying a world where actually, um, you know, most people's lives are not very nice. That, that that Warhammer all come about in the days of like one in ten and UB forty talking and yeah. singing about unemployment and Thatcher yeah. and yeah. Thatcher, strikes yeah. and yeah. Uh, three day weeks and all this sort of business going on. And of course, all of all of your Strontium Dog and Judge Dread during yeah. that period is all you know. It's a, not I mean, not even thinly veiled critique you know, of what's going at, on. Um, things that are ostensibly sort of like comedy in sort of like film and tv that are from britain so like uh, your black adders uh, things like that although they're funny shows they've been played for laughs there's a lot of stuff in the settings which is quite grimy and unpleasant oh, yeah. i mean obviously black adder goes forth when they're sort of in the oh, trenches yeah. is the most so sort of obvious example of that you know they despite the fact there's a lot of laughter and joking going on they talk about the horrendous conditions there and sort of what people had to go for. And you had the last episode, you know, where they all sort of go over the top. Mm. Yeah. And they, they all know they're going to die. And, and, and again, they brought class into it. You know, it was the, the man on the front and the people at the top, the people with money who had no idea what was going on, sending them into a futile battle. Mm. And a lot of the comedy yeah, I mean, it's, it's having a pop yeah. at, at the higher ups, isn't it? You know, Yes Minister and, and programs like that. It's, it's people having a pop at the top echelons of society. Mm. There are, there are revisionists who tried to suggest that the story wasn't that way in the First World War, but it, but it absolutely was. Mm. <laughs> I think Blackadder, Black they do. That's, that's what's so powerful about that, is that they do pretty much get it right. It's, yeah, it's like that gallows humour, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Mm. Look at, uh, if you look at the Battle of Waterloo, uh, when um, Lord Cardigan gets his uh, leg blown off, um, and then you've got Wells who's saying, you've lost your leg, sir. And he just says, oh my God, sir, you're right. You know, <laughs> humor. Look, oh shit, it's gone. It's like, oh yeah, gone, yeah. I was gonna say, if you if you're talking about class well, you've got the old classic sketch, haven't you, with the three memories like I look down on him because I yes, that's it. Yeah. the two Ronnies. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I know my place. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And obviously to like bring this back to RPGs, I mean it's present throughout pretty much all British media. I think yeah. potentially I mean feel free to correct me if you disagree, guys. I think potentially a little bit less nowadays because I think sort of like as with, with like the internet and sort of global communications every all the sort of influences from different areas mm. everyone's being influenced by like different countries and the cells which is a great thing in my, in my opinion yeah but you know m maybe sort of other issues are being brought in but like if you look at the traditionally sort of like british stuff just drawing mainly on british influences they pull from a lot of these events and i think because as you're saying the the early british role-playing games because they were sort of from that time when everything was quite unpleasant they're also drawing on those events they're reaching into the past they're pulling from those as well i say you, you see you see it in warhammer yeah I, I don't know that you see it so much in um fighting fantasy i mean you're the expert on that dave but uh, even fighting fantasy it's not if you were living there it's not a particularly pleasant setting. A lot of it. I mean, look at like Port Blacksand. That that'd be a horrible mm. place to actually live. Right, right, but, right. But, it's but got again, a, yeah. You've got like your Lord Azure in his like his palace, yeah. and you've got everyone else sort of like scrabbling around in the dirt trying to survive, like you know, like a troll guard's like boot on the back of their neck. But so, it's still funny. Lord Azure and the and the patrician in Terry Pratchett are very similar characters. Actually, I mean, you don't get so much development of Lord Azure, but the, yeah, but the, the 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 relish at the actions of the you know black-hearted dictator is quite is is quite good fun. Actually, did you see? There's a comment from Joe on the Twitch stream. He says we don't deal with this is Joe Richter. We don't deal with class and repression in American fantasy because it doesn't exist here. At least that's what they drill into us from birth. Yeah, um, but I think certainly, and at least until recently, I would say that yeah, maybe maybe um, a preparedness to laugh about those kinds of issues is is more distinctly yeah. British. And I, I, I think the other thing is that we're prepared to talk about it and not not afraid to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I think mm. one of the the best sort of ways I saw that represented is I, I saw a comedian once. I forget which comedian it was, and they were talking about the difference between like American and British crowds when you're like you're playing to a, a room, and they said like you come out you come out in a 
it might have been Reginald D. Hunter. You, so you come out to, to an American crowd and you're like, oh, how's everything going in New York? And they're like, woo, yeah, New yeah. York, yeah. You, you come out like somewhere like uh, Birmingham and you're like, oh, how's Birmingham doing? They're like, it's shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's that's like, your Warhammer. That's yeah, your Warhammer yeah, that, fantasy yeah, role play. That's right like the sort of English attitude. We don't really try and like sugarcoat anything. No. We, right. We, we, we know if something's shit, but, but we still laugh. And about I it. think that's that what, comes. What are you going to do? And I think that comes through in the role playing games. You know, it's that they go for the more realistic feel than the sort of the than the ideal, don't they? There's there's no American. There's no British dream. No. Um, it's more like it's it's Rodney and Del Boy. It's this time next year we'll be millionaires, but you know you're, <laughs> yeah. you're still living in Nelson Mandela hey, Careful, house. that's Colin's yeah. role model you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> there was clearly a big first for what the UK had to say for D and D across the pond, because mm. even to this day, the likes of um, Sinister Secret Assault Marsh and um, the Fiend Folio, which is probably like well, it's like one of the most off the wall AD and D books uh, right. that that came out. Um, but the Sinister Secret Assault Mask to this day is held up as a great example of a module, and the people voting for that have got to be in the majority. They've got to be Americans, I would think. So whatever we did, it appealed. Yeah. Uh, Probably because because it was something that they weren't getting homegrown, and it was something yeah, because it was different, and it yeah. it was a little bit zany, and it looked yeah. a bit different, and it had that kind of probably a bit of a freshness. I did a bit of research before we came to air on this episode, and I've dug out what I think is the first ever British RPG, which is Heroes by Tabletop Games, which was released in 1979. With that setting, it was set in the European Dark Ages. And the blurb about it, it's mostly about carousing, whoring, <laughs> and fighting. It, it, it includes... Friday, it's, what's stand, it called? Friday Night week, Out on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Friday, Friday Night Out in Luton. Uh, it, it's got rabid dogs, floods, blizzards, venereal disease, and mutilation. No Hold fantasy. on, that's not accurate. Yeah. We don't have floods. No fantasy, no <laughs> magic. No fantasy, no magic, just blood and snot brawling with percentile dice. <laughs> So that's it. The, fir- the first British RPG, and it's in, in there. <laughs> to, to be fair, I don't know what that says about me, but as you were describing that, I was like, that sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic, man. I can't wait to find out what that is like. We'll have to do an actual play. <laughs> yeah. But if you look at you look at um, you know all of British media back in the seventies, I mean, what did the Yanks had Star Trek? What did we have? Blake Seven, bloody wobbly sets, crap scripts. You know, um, hammy acting. Well, yeah, I mean, look, look at things like in um, the old like Doctor Who, where like oh yeah, all, all the, 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 the same the, quarry in North Wales for every bloody planet. Yeah, they I had mean, no budget. The, the, I think there was there was a sort of like a in role play and other media in sort of a in the, the sort of the day. That there was a very sort of DIY sort of almost like mm. make do and men sort of like feel to it, where like say, I said, I remember like the. Like the first edition copy of like War on a Fancy Roleplay got and it and it and it was a bit of a clunky system. The layout was a bit shonky. Some of the artwork wasn't brilliant. But it was one of those things where you looked at it and you're almost like, Do you know what? I reckon I could probably do something like that myself. Mm-hmm. So I think in a way that probably did actually help a lot of people sort of get into the idea of like, oh you know, maybe I could maybe I could make my own system. Maybe I yeah. Because there didn't seem such a divide between the the people who were doing it like professionally, as was at the time, and the people who were sort of doing it as like a cottage industry or like a sort of amateur industry, uh, which I think the gaps got sort of like bigger and bigger. But I think ironically now it's sort of it's closing down again because obviously we've got new technologies, so you can get like a, a good desktop publishing program on your computer. You can you can get like free public domain art off the internet you can get in touch with people on the net to like find people to like edit your work uh do some layout for you and stuff like that so i almost think we went through a period where if it was going to be professional you had to have like big money behind it but now it started to sort of go the other way back to what it used to be where there's less of a divide between these like amazingly professionally plush produced products and like the stuff people produce at home so i've got i've got books here that have been sort of done on a 
a fair shoestring budget compared to like some of like the bigger companies within roleplay. And I know roleplay is like a niche industry, so even the big budgets aren't massive, but you can get some quite good stuff now by people who they're, they're like one man bands or they've done all the writing themselves and they maybe paid someone to do a bit of editing and a bit of layout and art for them. And thanks to things like print on demand and like drive through and Lulu and stuff like that, you can still put out quite professional looking product. And I think that's a good thing in some ways because it draws people in, you know, you get a better product, but yeah. also do we, do we perhaps lose something with that sort of like, copy and pasted together sort of like scissors and glue in a garage somewhere sort of feel to some of the older stuff the, the, the problem you've got these days is trying to get noticed isn't it at least in the old days if you had a big publishing house be behind you you had somewhere someone to put your stuff out now you're self-publishing it's very hard to stand out in the crowd to, to get your little product whatever it may be noticed by by a big audience because there's so many products you go to drive through there's so many products on there now coming out all the time you, you can't keep up with them Mm-hmm. I think though the the British have got a probably a history of making a lot of noise for a small place. You know, if you look at music, a lot of music comes out of the UK. And, and getting back to what John was saying, there's that punk thing, that 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 kind of you know that punk vibe. But I know probably a lot of that come from the states, but there was there was a UK punk thing as well, wasn't there? Um, and I wonder, going back to the war, that austerity, that kind of make doing men thing. Um, back in the seventies, that wasn't that. It wasn't that far away at that point, was it? You know, no. You, we've we've probably all got those grandparents that every time they empty a bag, they fold it up and put the bag in the drawer. Or still, still do that today, some of us. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you, everything gets hoarded away and 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 saved. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you didn't waste anything because, I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, stuff that we, we consider every day now, vegetables and, and fruits all year round. In the 70s, we didn't have that. It was still very seasonal. Stuff was still being shipped in from abroad and uh, rationing hadn't long ended. Mm. That's it. I mean, I, th- I think uh, at a certain stage, you you start looking around for something new and you find something that you like maybe in a, a culture that has different values or that has a different emphasis. So I remember there was a big um, there was a big fad for sort of like Viking sort of or like Norse based games at one point, and there seemed to be like loads of them coming out all the time. Because yeah, everyone sort board of jumped, games especially, yeah, yeah. everyone sort of jumped on that and was like, oh yeah, like like Viking stuffs like the big thing. Like we're really inspired by that, and like it was everywhere. And then it moved on to something else. And you see that in TV, like say board games, role playing games. Pirates. It was a couple of years ago. Everything was pirates, pirate pirates. board games, pirate board games, pirate role playing games, pirate TV shows. Yeah. So what about we haven't really talked about our interest in the Fae and the fairy, and um, yeah, one I mean, thing one thing I've noticed is this fixation uh, with strange mushrooms. Every British RPG <laughs> yeah, has got yeah, weird right, mushrooms yeah. in it. Every single one. Yeah. I mean, we know this side, the, um, the the Great London book for the Midlands has got, like, mushrooms in it. Um, mm-hmm. The the, the behind-the-wall adventure yeah. I wrote for Midlands has got mushrooms in it. Sure has. Um, it's, it's a British pastime, yeah. drinking mushrooms. Winter's Daughter for Old School Essentials, random mushroom table in it. Um, Mousonian Arts Council have put out that Fungi of the Far Realms mm-hmm. book. So I, I think there is this idea of sort of, like, you know, like folklore and that sort of, like, but I would say the, the sort of like the older sort of like I suppose like pagan sort of like beliefs, you know, like fairies, uh, stuff like that, uh, which were still like quite in vogue up until the sort of Victorian age. Well, I mean, most of it, most of it is a Victorian invention, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the whole fairy concept um, is a pretty Victorian construct, I would say. Um, but that's funny, you see, because I, when I'm thinking British RPGs, it's funny. I'm not actually thinking of anything really culturally or historically British. I'm just thinking of those games in the 80s and 90s, linking to a lot of our sort of cultural products of the 80s and 90s that are largely sort of science fiction. You know, it's still mm. got Judge Dredd in my head. Judge Dredd yeah. is a vision of America. It's the US. Mm. He goes to Brits occasionally, but it's a, it's a, it's a British vision of the US. So but, I mean, but it's interesting you're saying that. I don't, based I, on I David Carradine as well, only. 
based on right. David Carradine right. in, two, in um, Death Race. That, that was the inspiration right. for it. And then we turn right. it into a, a British sort of sensation. I, mean, I, I yeah. think it's odd because I, I agree with uh, Dave that like a lot of the sort of earlier games, they were maybe not sort of referencing like the history of Britain so mm. much. It was just sort of a feeling and like a an emotion of like what was occurring at the time and certain iconic things like we're saying the class divide stuff like that. But I think as we've gone on, yeah, it's more been, recently yeah, it's we, the we, trend. You know, no one's really like saying anything new by going there's a class divide because we all know it. So I think, in a way, as time's gone forward, it's almost as so though games have started sort of delving like further back mm. to try and find to sort of like find an element they can they can reinvigorate that will bring something new to the games. Yeah, and, and there was another one called Liminal that came out was it last year or the year before, which it, again sort of dealt on similar themes of folklore. And I think sort of we've got a good sort of history of folklore and legends, haven't we? Going back a long, long time, and it's good inspiration to draw on you know yeah i mean i think there's there's obviously like i said the strong sort of uh like i say probably slightly invented sort of like pagan past stuff there's the the more sort of crypto zoological stuff like i said like the Loch Ness monster the beast of bodmin etc but we've also got like a lot of the like the horror legend you know, like there's there's so many buildings that they claim to be haunted oh, in yeah. britain there's like a long history of people ha experiencing like supernatural occurrences for want of a better word and all that is there's loads of books that are easily available i've got one called uh, law of the land which is just like a big thick book all about different sort of legends from britain and the so i need a book i need a book like that that yeah. that would be cool it's <laughs> it's a good book it's uh, the law of the land a guide to england's legends from spring hill jack to the witches of war boys ah. it's by oh. jennifer westwood i seem to remember it's it's fairly cheap. I'm just going to say how much it is on Amazon. So, it, other I, booksellers are available. I, I think um, as well we're um, we're we're a bit of a sort of a, a patchwork nation because if you look at like the history of so Britain, like how many various people have like invaded or moved to Britain, all bringing their own sort of uh, their own legends, their own sort of spin, leaving their own mark on the landscape. So, the, one of the most obvious example I can think of is like the Romans. You know, we've still got like bits of Roman Road. We've still got like mm. Hadrian's Wall. There's like the Roman Baths, stuff like that. So, and there's a lot of sort of monuments and things from before then, which are around. So it's almost like uh, the, the sort of deeper you you delve into that, every time you like scratch off a layer, there's another layer underneath from potentially a different culture. So there's a lot of different things in that sort of big cultural melting pot which you can easily draw on i mean that's why i'm i'm so, one of the reasons i'm such a big fan of like the middle and settings and like one of my fantasy yeah. role and stuff like that because i i mean I, i'm a big fan of things like mr james like ghost stories and stuff like that mm. so there's loads of ghost stories which draw on english legends you can pick up you can pretty much go to any town or city in england and you'll find some legends there you can pick up any sort of history book of britain and there'll be some sort of strange legends or there'll be like a cathedral with like a leaning spire with a story about it and right. so that's so there's yeah. just so much you can draw on well no, i think it's interesting <laughs> because as we as we were talking about sort of uh, uh, the victorian era when there was like a revival of like spiritualism and stuff like yeah. that so over the course of history these various events and legends and stuff like that they've been sort of revived tweaked changed and reinvented to suit whatever the particular sort of ethos was at the time because obviously a lot of history because we can't know for certain a lot of it's subjective so when we look back we tend to bring our own sort of our own prejudices and our own views to it um i mean you i, I was watching a tv program the other day where it was um it was talking about all the various documentaries that the bbc's done over the years about stonehenge and how the like theories have developed and changed, and mm. as you as it, you sort of like old sort of I think panorama sort of like video video clips and stuff like that, and you could see as the years went on that different eras sort of emphasised different theories that like suited their own way of looking at the world. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it's. Um subject to all kinds of ideological manipulations like you see on the school curriculum you know my, my michael gove wanted to tell the story of our island nation yeah i mean we've got um, we've got joe on the on the twitch feed is saying uh, 
it's good that us folks have got so many ancient sites. Uh, so that a lot of the the ones in America have been sort of systematically destroyed in an effort to to prove that sort of like white people were the first people over there. And I, I, I would hesitate to say that like no ancient monuments have been destroyed over here because they have been. I mean, part of, not the only reason, but part of the reason why a lot of these sort of like these old like pagan beliefs have been like invented wholesale or sort of reinvented is because either they didn't leave things behind or what they had left behind was changed or destroyed so we've sort of got the same process over here things are being continually destroyed and reinvented and then rediscovered later on and sort of looked at in a new light but when you look back at that process that's almost as interesting and tells you as much as the original the original sort of uh, historical event if you see what i mean yeah, uh, it always makes me sad when I, when the subject of indigenous people comes up because it's a shocking, it's a shocking waste of knowledge and um, law about a place if if you 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 come in. It's the same Australia. It's the same the world over. The where the the um, the conquering power comes in and then get stomping over a place and you lose all that all that rich kind of yeah i mean story there you know i was just going to say john i've oh. ordered that law of the land now on your recommendation yeah it's it's, it's just it's about a five it's about, if i remember yeah, between five and eight quid but while i was reading reviews for that another one that's recommended but don't get it on amazon because it's a silly price is called folklore myths and legends of britain it was a reader's digest hardback um you can get it on ebay for about 16 to 30 pound but if you go on amazon it's 450 quid for the hardback so i'll oh, leave that right but, uh, but what's good what, what's good right. about this stuff is you can go into any crappy gift shop in a village can't you when you're on holiday you go into any village any any rural and you you pick up all this kind of stuff you know little flimsy paperbacks and they've all yep. been sort of self-published by a local author i love those you know like little sort of 80 page things you know yeah. this the legends of bed geller or this yeah. legends oh, of wherever yeah, you happen geller, to be yeah. these little yeah. flappy little books i love them i can't get mm. enough of them <laughs> or you jump or you jump into your tourist information center and you've got all these like maps and yeah stuff like that you can pick up loads of leaflets in there you know where you get a, a picture of like uh where was it somewhere like um salisbury um s somewhere somewhere around salisbury and i went into the city and there was like a town map and it was a stunning looking map just showing you where all the sites were boom straight in your rpg you had a, a great little drawer in there I, i'll have to dig that out and post that up because it's a great great map and really inspirational and it's just they're handing them out brilliant we've we've also as well which um plays a, a part in rpgs obviously not so much in modern day but certainly in the past religion played a huge part in the sort of everyday life of people in britain and obviously without delving too much into sort of like philosophy and stuff like that because a lot of people sort of in medieval times like the people who could write <laughs> so a lot of the stuff that's written down was by um, priests, uh, monks. Uh, they were the people who could write and record stuff. So a lot of these sort of these ancient legends, like if you look at, uh, I forget which cathedral it is, but it's like the devil like leaned on it and made the the spire lean. So a lot of the older legends have these sort of like religious overtones, and obviously, and, and remember that the uh, you know that like the the. Uh... The royalty in power would often change, get them to change the books to fit in there with, with their ideologies as well. And King Arthur was, was the prime example of that one. That's it. I mean, it's, if you look at um, like your standard sort of D and D style games, there is uh, an element of religion in it because one of the classes is cleric, and then if you've also got your druid, so you've got that sort of, I suppose, sort of later religion there, whether it's polytheistic or monotheistic or whatever right actually that was that was unapologetically christian monotheistic i mean the, the clerics were there because the vampires were there mm. um and you know the legends were and that's why when you when you read your white box your cleric there's no holy symbol it's priced up as a cross mm. that's what's there in the equipment list it was it was a it was a it was directly your sort of crusader priest figure well, um, well, the polytheism came much later 
But that said, there you've got, you've got the sort of animosity between like the the, the cleric and the druid. So you've got that sort of, like you said, like that monotheistic sort of Christian style religion against this older sort of more natural sort of living in the wilds religion. So that that sort of again that sort of dichotomy, which is like a part of like the British heritage, is pretty much enshrined within like the very core sort of classes of like even your earliest versions of D and know the druid came a bit later, but the cleric's been there right from the get go, mm-hmm. as far as I remember. So Yeah. That's that is British role playing. It's that scene from uh the Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh, it's all there. You know, they've just they've just been clippy clopping along, all dressed in their on in their <laughs> chain mail, and then you've got Michael Pale you've got Michael Palin raking around in the shit, spouting yeah. a sort of Marxist account yeah. of class yeah. oppression. That's that's your British yeah. RPG. He's a and a bit of Jabberwocky. Yeah, a bit of Jabberwocky, yeah. yeah. I think I'm, much, I, I'm much safer. I know I've brought, I've invoked Monty Python, but I feel much safer on that territory than some of the other places I, I, we've got. I think, <laughs> I think that that sort of grimy, sort of like, like that scrabbling around in the dirt sort of viewpoint does suit the, the sort of like earlier OSR games well. Like you, you start out as like a level one character, and you're pretty much like a strong breeze can kill you. You have to worry about things. Uh, you're not some great hero sort of swinging an enchanted sword, you know, like romping through, hacking your way through like the barbarian horns or whatever. You're, you're someone who's only taken like half a step out of the muck of the common man at the start of your adventuring career. Mm. So I think that that's possibly why, certainly for myself, that's why the sort of earlier like OSR games tend to speak to me a little bit more. Mm. And I'm going to leave Colin a call on his podcast where we just, just like give him some grief about uh, saying that uh, it's not true that uh, fifth edition has like more sort of superheroic characters. But, but because... You'll be the first of many, John. Join the queue, mate, I'm afraid. Right. Take a <laughs> ticket. Take it's, a ticket. <laughs> it just depends... That all just depends how you interpret the mechanics, doesn't it? I mean, I, I'd play... Just hit people play, harder. You just hit the yeah, I'd, play an, I'd play an OSR game, roll all the same dice, and then describe it as wall running, leaping across the branches. You know, you can describe anything, any of those dice rolls. You can describe it as if it's Legolas doing it, and suddenly but, it's a superpower game. You haven't changed the mechanics at all. But even, it doesn't matter what you're, what you're role-playing in Britain, you still get those Monty Python quotes in-game, don't you? And no, you, yeah. you bring up all, all that humour from the... From the that's uh, global, yeah. 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 I can't no believe we from Monty Python. I can't believe we talked <laughs> for nearly an hour and didn't bring Monty Python until right at the end. What? what? <laughs> yes. 